what was known as Jim Crow and the discriminatory laws. Um, anytime they made a move towards using a park, the city council cut off the tennis court's nets, right? They made a move for African Americans to use the public library, they locked the library. And when they demonstrated in the streets, they were thrown in jail. This was all nonviolent social protest of the tradition of, um, of Gandhi. Um, Slater King was the president of the Albany movement. He was a first cousin of Martin Luther King. Now, not all of this protesting was always um, so nonviolent, at least uh, on the side of the, the sheriff's department. This is a picture of Slater King's brother, C.B. King, one of the most prominent uh, African-American attorney in town after he had protested the uh, treatment of some of the demonstrators put in the local <coughs> jail. This is a protest march for the college students from Albany State because when the students from Albany State stood in solidarity with the demonstrators that were marching in the street, they were expelled from this public college. And this is the dean of students who resigned her job, Mrs. Slater King, who were protesting the fact that they've all lost their jobs and all these students have been expelled. So Slater King was one of the leaders of this, uh, this movement, and she's the president of the Albany movement, who's later a leader of the community address movement. Second person is Bob Swan. Bob Swan was a northern peace activist from Ohio, who was also a carpenter. He was a pacifist, a carpenter, and when the southern racists were firebombing black churches, he came south to help rebuild the black churches that had been firebombed. He also had a bunch of friends over in Albany who found themselves in Albany jail. About 1964-65, Bob comes over to Albany and meets Slater King for the first time. And the interesting thing is that both of them find themselves asking themselves the same question. You've got this African-American civil rights activist from the Deep South who's asking himself the question, what comes next? After all the demonstrations, all the marching in the streets, after you get your political rights, what happens to African-Americans in their housing, in their jobs? How do they have a place to stand? He's already looking ahead. Bob Swan, this pacifist, white guy from the North, has been a pacifist and doing anti-war work for years. He's asking himself the same question. What comes after protests? I, for many years, I wondered, how is it that in the height, the fires of the Civil Rights Movement in the American South, when activists are being jailed, when they're being, you know, churches are being firebombed, how is it that this pacifist from the North and as African Americans in the South actually were able to see eye to eye. Who is the trust? And of course, finally found that you always should look to the women. Because Bob Swan's wife was one of the founders of the Congress of Racial Equality in Chicago. And right after um, they moved from Chicago to a little town of Yellow Springs, Ohio. And they had a couple of daughters. And every once in a while, they wanted a night in the town, so they would hire a babysitter to come from the local college to babysit their kids. So the young voice and education student at Antioch College who babysit for the, the Swans, Coretta Scott, who a number of years later happened to marry a fiery young preacher from Atlanta, Martin Luther King. So it's interesting that the basis of trust between these two activists, one of pacifists from the North, white, the other civil rights activists from the South, black, was that there had been this intersection of family histories years before. Now, what each Bob and Slater King brought something different to this conversation. What Bob brought to the conversation was his knowledge of the Grand Don movement in India. Following the assassination of Gandhi in 1948, the spiritual legacy, the leadership of this movement, was inherited by the noble body. He was came to be known as the walking saint of India. He would walk from village to village, challenging the rich landowners, saying, we have all these poor people, we have all these people who want to farm, who will give me land? And Lord behold, over the next five years, 
He had rich landowners donate to his land gift program almost 3 million acres of land. That land was distributed to landless peasants, to the untouchables, to the rural agricultural workers. But after five years, when Mogababe and his colleagues discovered that something was happening to that land, it was being lost. These low income, these impoverished rural farmers who had received this land for free were losing it to loan sharks, predatory lenders, one thing or another, and this happened. So Mogababe, instead of taking land from the rich landowners and giving it away to individuals, created village trust, where the land would be held in trust and leased to those farmers. And the farmers then could produce their livelihood, build their homes, but it was to protect, prevent the loss of the land. This is what Bob Swan kind of brought to the conversation with Slater King. What Slater King brings to the conversation is the knowledge of Koinonia Farm, which is just outside of Albany, Georgia, which is the only place in the Deep South, at the height of the Civil Rights Movement, where you had blacks and whites actually living together cooperatively on the same land, living together, praying together, working together on a cooperatively organized farm. Slater King says to Bob, you know, that sounds an awful like lot like that Graham Cromdon movement you're talking about over in India. This became a pretty important example for these two fellows, not least of which because this farm was attacked again and again by the Ku Klux Klan, because the last thing the Klan wanted was this good example, this harmonious example of blacks and whites living together, working together, praying together on the same land. And what the organizers, the supporters of Cornelia Farm realized is that if you're going to sustain a progressive, radical, unusual social experiment, it's not enough just to organize the people who are going to live inside that experiment. You have to build a larger base of support outside your community. Bob Swan actually became the national chair of Friends of Koinonia, helping to market their agricultural goods and to, uh, to raise money for Koinonia Farm. Now, incidentally, Koinonia um, Farm was also the seedbed for another national and today international movement, Habitat for Humanity, started at Koinonia Farm. And some of the ideas for the modern day community land trust came out of Koinonia Farm too. It's had a common seedbed for two of our movements in the United States that for 20 years kind of developed on parallel tracks. Increasingly in the United States today, we have Habitat for Humanity and CLTs kind of converging and working together in partnership. Another part of this conversation was uh, Charles Sherrod, who worked for, he was a field organizer for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. These were the kick-ass, knock on the door, drag people out to voter registration activists the height of the civil rights movement. I mean, these were the door to door things. Um, and Charles Sherrod started asking himself a similar question. He after he left Albany, went back to divinity school, came back with a degree in divinity, and now he was the Reverend Charles Sherrod. And he comes back and asks himself a similar question to Bob Swan and Slater King. What comes after you get your rights? How do you secure your economic and residential and the final person in this dialogue is a woman named Faye Bennett, who was the head of the Sharecroppers Fund. This was an organization created in the Deep South who were worried about the displacement of tenant farmers and sharecroppers who were being displaced from agriculture in the Deep South because of mechanization and as retaliation for their organizing for civil rights. It was her organization that actually came up with the money to send a group of activists to Israel in 1968 to take a look at the largest example of land leasing with agriculture combined with agricultural communities uh, in the world. And eight people, including these four, went to Israel, spent there, spent about three weeks there looking at land leasing, looking at Kibbutzim, looking at Moshavi and came back all fired up with the idea that, you know, we could have, we could create a Guangdong movement 
in America.